Hello, and a very warm welcome to everyone joining us for today's Select Science webinar. Tips and tricks for accurate and reproducible pipetting. Be connected and, and take your productivity to the next level. My name is Dora Wells, and I'll be moderating today's presentation. So I'm delighted to be joined by today's speaker, Kate Morgan from Sartorius. Kate's experience with pipetting began in the 90s when she joined the Forensic Science Service as part of the DNA database team. There, she spent countless hours in the QC lab with Pipette. Next, she moved to Sartorius, where she was involved with sales of liquid handling products, then business development of small instruments. Currently, she is the regional business manager for Lab Essentials in Europe, the Middle East and Asia. After the presentations, we'll move on to our question and answer session. Please feel free to ask any question for the Q&A session at any time during the webinar. You can submit your question at the speech bubble icon to the left of your screen. And now, without further delay, I'd like to hand it over to Kate for today's presentation. And I'd like to thank her for presenting to us today. Please go ahead. Hello, and thank you for joining me on this webinar of Getting Pipetting Right. Tips and tricks for accurate and reproducible results. I'm Kate Morgan, Regional Business Manager for Sartorius. Sartorius is a life science research tools provider, which includes products and consumables from lab water systems, lab filtration, balances, biological analyzers, microbiological products, and of course, what we're talking about today, pipettes and tips. Today, I wanted to share with you some tips and tricks that we can use when we are pipetting to get accurate and reproducible results, as well as introducing the newest electronic pipette to Sartorius, the Pikas 2. I'm sure if you are already working in a lab, there will be some information that you already know, but I hope that I can share with you something new that perhaps you didn't know, or at least remind you of something that you may have forgotten. In this presentation, I'm going to break down the sources of error and what we can do to reduce them. So first thing, why is it important that we get pipetting right? So if we take, for example, live cell experiments, when we put our assays into an analyzing system, and in this instance, in the picture, the incusite, we want to get accurate and reproducible results. However, these results will only be reproducible and accurate if our sample preparation is good. And in the case of live cell experiments, pipetting can create many variances. For example, in the cell seeding, if we don't mix well, bubbles if we have a foaming liquid, if we don't pipette our volumes correctly in cereal dilutions, and finally, if we don't consider temperature differences in our liquids and the environment. So here we have two targets, A and B, and we want to understand which is one is accurate and which one is precise. So if we take target A, we can see that the points are very close together but they're not close to the centre of the target. Whereas in B, the points are a little more spread out, but are closer to the centre. So which one is accurate? Well, actually, B is accurate because the points are closer to the centre. However, A is more precise. And in liquid handling, what we're really looking for is accurate and precise. So we can repeat those results. This next slide actually shows better what accuracy and precision looks like in terms of liquid handling. So if we look at diagram A, you can see the yellow line, which is our target volume here. This is very good results because they are accurate and they are precise. The next diagram, B, is precise but not accurate, because if we look, we can see that all the volumes are 
um, the same, but they're not at the target volume where the yellow line is. And this could be many reasons. It could be systematic pipetting errors, error in calibration, perhaps change the pipette tip without calibration. In the next diagram, C, we can see this accurate but not precise. So the volumes are all close to that target volume that we want to achieve, but they're not there. And again, this, there are many reasons for this. We could have inconsistent pipetting technique or perhaps not a great pipette tip combination. And finally, D, the one that none of us want, um, is, is, is neither accurate nor precise. And this could be down to things like leaky piston and cylinder system. That could be due to lack of maintenance or poor tip fitting. So, ISO 8655, which is the gold standard for service, states that there are four sources of error. Pipettes and tips, pipetting technique, types of liquid and the environment. And this is what we're going to look at today individually and how we can reduce those errors. So starting with um, pipettes and tips. The first thing that we're going to look at is the correct um, is the correct pipette. For the volume, so the correct pipette for the volume that we are pipetting. So just because a pipette states that it can pipette the volume, it does not necessarily mean that it will be the most accurate. So if we look at, um, so if we look at this diagram here, if you're looking for accuracy, you need to be aware of the manufacturer specification, which is what this table is showing. And in this slide, we can see the specifications for the Tacta mechanical pipette at three different volumes. 10 to 100, 20 to 200, and 100 to 1,000. So if we were looking to pipette 100 microliters, we can see that the maximum permissible systematic error and the random errors change depending on the volume of the pipette. So if you were to use a 1,000 microliter pipette for 100 microliters, you can see that the maximum permissible system error is plus or minus 2.5 microliters. Compared to 0.8 microliters, if you were um, if you're looking to use a 20 to 200, sorry, a 10 to 100 microliter pipette. So this is a big difference. So the recommendation is that you always best to use the pipette that has the maximum volume closest to the volume that you are pipetting. So in this example, you would be best to use the 10 to 100 microliter pipette. So next bit about pipettes and tips, if we move on to service. So looking at service, a leaky piston and cylinder can create an error of up to 50% which is a, a large error. And this is because pistons can get dry because grease is worn away, O-rings will get worn with use. And if you're using volatile liquids that release gases, then pistons can become corroded. <clears throat> and as you can see, this is happening on the inside of the pipette, as you can see from these pictures. So although you use it every day, you maybe don't check the inside. It is very important that you do have maintenance plan for instruments where they are serviced and calibrated regularly to reduce this error. So final in pipettes and tips is using the correct tips. So here we're going to look at correct tips for your pipette. So just because a tip fits, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get the most accurate results. And here we have a graph showing a PECAS 10 microliter pipette with 10% volume. So we're not using the best pipette for this volume. But this is just to show the differences between the different tip types. 
So the Sulturi's tips are the ones in yellow. And as you can see from the diagram, from this graph, they are providing the most precise results. And in terms of systematic error are the best. And the reason we can say that is because they're very close to this central line. And the, the points are not too spread. Um, but there is some systematic error. They're not exactly on that central line. So the PET could be calibrated to correct this. If we look at tips B, which are this turquoise blue colour, they are neither accurate or precise because we can see that they're far away from that central line um, and they're actually quite spread out. So tip A is actually the Sartori's OptiFit tip, which is good to know. Um, so yeah, so systematic error can be minimised with the calibration, but random errors remain. So we're now going to move on to the PET technique. And first of all, I'm just going to introduce um, why petting techniques are so important. So this graph is showing the random error with different volume mechanical pipettes and how the user can, sorry, how the experience of the user can affect the random error. So from this graph, we can see that experienced users have less random errors um, and those that are inexperienced have a lot more. Um, what this graph illustrates is that good pipetting techniques are critical to get good results in small volumes. So let's look at the different pipetting modes. So starting with the forward pipetting mode, this is the one that is most commonly used um, and is also the one that is used in the factory calibration and service. It's very simple. You push down to stop one, release to aspirate, and then push down to step one to dispense. And then continue to push down to the second stop for blowout. Reverse pipetting is a less commonly used or known about, but it's really useful for those difficult liquids, which we'll talk about in a bit more detail later on. So this technique has to be used carefully as it's very easy to dispense more than the volume that you require. So we start by pressing the plunger all the way down to the bottom to step two. You then lift the plunger all the way to the top to aspirate. And this is where you have to be careful because you then push the plunger down to the first stop so that you dispense the correct volume. Obviously, you'll then have some waste material left in your tip. So you push, you make sure that you have a waste vessel and to dispense what's left of that liquid, you push the plunger all the way down. So moving on to sources of pipetting error. We can see that Poor pipetting technique can lead to different percentage errors of the volume dispensed. So, for example, failure to wipe the tip on the vessel wall can lead up to 3%. And this picture shows really nicely that bead of liquid at the end of the pipette tip if it's not touched against the side of the beaker, which could be lost. If you fail to pre-wet the tip and then fail to wipe the tip of the vessel wall, then these errors can start to add up. So all of a sudden, you've lost 5%. And we're going to look at some of these in a bit more detail. So pre-wetting um, is the first one that we're going to, to look at. So pre-wetting is recommended by the ISO 8655 standard to, to improve accuracy. And as you can see from the graph, 
if you don't pre-wet, then the dispensed volume will be smaller than the required volume. And this is because the liquid and the piston is an air column. And the liquid starts, sorry, between the liquid and the piston is an air column. And the liquid starts to evaporate until the air becomes saturated and the dispensed volume will be correct. So from this graph on the left, as you can see, this happens after about three pre-rinses. So obviously, the drier the air, the more pre-rinses are required. So depending on where you are, it can take up to five pre-rinses. Same is not true when you do reverse pipetting, because as we talked about previously, you're aspirating more liquid than you require. So that additional volume of liquid um, is not being lost due to evaporation. So looking at aspiration and pipetting angle, Pipetting angle when aspirating is important, so you need the tip to enter at 90 degrees, shown as zero on the graph, to the liquid. So this is because if you tilt the pipette, you are increasing the surface area inside the tip. So instead of it being a circle, you'll actually be creating an oval. So you will aspirate a larger volume than set. And this graph shows nicely the effect of tilting the pipette tip. And finally, the last pipetting area error that I'm going to look at is an even piston movement. So having an even and smooth piston movement when pipetting, um, in my experience, actually is perhaps the hardest part and is something that comes with experience. Um, but it's also affected by how many hours you've been pipetting for. So the more tired you are, if we're getting to the end of the day on a Friday evening, um, then then the harder it gets and if you also if you're in a hurry. So although uneven piston movement is not a big error generally, in some cases it can have quite a big effect. And a good example of this is in cell seeding. So this graph is showing the phase object confluence percentage against time. So the yellow line is A1, which responds to the images B and D. Black line is D5, which is images C and D. And even at the start, you can see there are big differences between image B and C. There is a variation in the cell seeding. And even after 72 hours of cultivation, the well A1, which is image D, has not caught up with up to well D5, which is image E. And this is due to inadequate mixing, which can be due to an even piston movement. If your piston movement is jerky, then what will happen is that you'll increase the cell shearing. So finally, on um, pipetting technique, we're going to look at electronic pipettes. So we've already looked at mechanical pipette graph and that the more experience you have, um, the less errors. So this is the graph that we can see on the on the left hand side. So what the electronic graph shows is that the magnitude of error with different volumes is similar and that perpetuating skills and experience have very little impact. And this is because of the consistent electronic pipette piston movement, which compensates for that pipetting te technique faults originating from plunger use. So one of the reasons that electronic pipettes improves pipetting accuracy is because it reduces the forces that are required in manual pipetting, as we can see from this graph. So it takes out those differences in experience and those changes in pipetting techniques during the day. And here you can see the difference between the total cumulative force per, per purposing cycle when comparing a sartorius picus and a mechanical pipette.
So we've now established that one of the real advantages of electronic pipettes is that they significantly reduce the user to user variability in pipetting and allows everyone to reach that expert level. It also means that the error of an either rhythm and timing that according to ISO 8655 can lead to a 2% increase in standard deviation is, limited, is eliminated as the electronic pipette controls the piston movement. So an electronic pipette also allows the possibility of multi-dispensing. So you can dispense the same volume many times with one aspiration. And then sequential dispensing, which allows you to dispense different volumes that have been preset in one aspiration. And this can speed up work and reduce errors. You're also able to carry out dilutions by aspirating the dilute, dilutant and then the sample or re reagent with an air gap in between. And you can see the little air gap between the two different coloured liquids in that diagram. So the next source of error that we're going to look at is liquids. So there are four liquids that we're going to look at as shown on this slide. And the first one that we're going to start with is viscous liquids. So viscous liquids have a high resistance to flow and tend to stick on tip surface. So they're really hard to prepare. Um, and if you've tried, you tend to get air bubbles. So in my experience, um, I've actually tried to prepare honey um, and it is really difficult. So in this graph, we're showing pipettes, pipetting with 75% glycerol. So as we all know, that's quite a, a viscous liquid, um, not as viscous as honey, uh, with the forward and reverse pipetting, um, a mechanical pipette was used and there was a pre-rinse. And the same tip was used for each step. So we can see, with forward pipetting, there is a lot of variation. However, in reverse pipetting, or when using a dispenser pipette, also known as a positive displacement pipette, then you can get better results. And the PAR chart looks at how the speed can affect the volume with the viscous liquids. So one is a slow pipetting speed, and eight is a fast pipetting speed. For best results, you need to either reverse pipette or use a positive displacement pipette. And when you do you when you do pipette, the aspiration dispense need to be done very slowly. You also need to make sure that you dispense against the wall of the vessel. So the next that we're going to look at is foaming liquids. So liquids that foam are difficult to get accurate results. And again, this graph shows that with forward pipetting, you get a lot of variability and that your best option is reverse pipetting slowly. I'd also recommend that you use safety space tips because these have a bigger gap between the top of the liquid and the filter so that if you do get foam in your tip, it doesn't touch the filter. So finally, moving on to hot and cold liquids. So ideally, all liquids would be prepared at room temperature. But as we know, this is not always possible due to samples being needed to be kept at cooler or warmer temperatures, especially those that need to be kept in the fridge. So if we are pipetting at a different temperature, then the dispensed volume may deviate from the target volume 
And this is due to the change in volume in the air column. So if the liquid is colder than the room temperature, then the air, then the air column expands due to the difference in temperature between the sample and the air column. So if you continue to use the same tip as shown in the graph, then less volume is being aspirated and dispensed. The opposite occurs with warm liquids because the air column is then contracting, meaning that more volume is aspirated and then dispensed. As shown by that graph. So best practice for cold and warm liquids, as we said, ideally, we'd have them at room temperature, but then as we're not able to do that, our recommendation is to pre-wet the tips because we don't want to give the air column chance to expand or contract. And also make sure that you change the tip after each dispense. Finally, final liquid is volatile liquids. So if you've ever perpetrated ethanol, you'll know that it evaps very, evaporates very quickly. So evaporation can cause the air column to expand, which means that you often get a dripping pipette tip. Sure, we've all experienced this. In these cases, it is recommended to re-wet the pipette sheet tip, and this is so that you can saturate that air column. Um, you can also use reverse pipetting so that if there is any evaporation, it's taken from the ex excess volume. And also you need to work um, with a consistent but rapid pace. So we're now going on to our final error source which is the environment. And on this, I wanted to look at the environment that we work in, especially ergonomics. So we're going to start with the workstation. So if you think of your workspace as having two semicircles, closest to you is your normal working area, which is 10 to 30 centimetres from your table edge, and your maximum a working area, which should be no more than one arm's length away, where you can comfortably reach without extending from the shoulder or bending from the back. So on average, this is about 40 to 50 centimetres away from you. Your most often used items, your most often used items like samples, pipette tips, etc., should obviously be in your normal working area. And for those less frequently used items, like your pipettes, um, et cetera, should be in the maximum working area where you can pick them up when needed. So think about how you place all your items around your work station, your workplace. So you're looking to stay in as neutral position as possible. So avoid leaning on your elbows, forearms and wrists. And by doing this, it all helps to reduce the strain and keeps your pipetting position comfortable. And as we know, if your pipetting position is comfortable, then your pipetting technique will be good. So moving on to the final um, topic in the environment, and that's biosafety cabinets. So looking at the ergonomics in a biosafety cabinet, here we've got a diagram of a cabinet. I've highlighted various pieces of kit. So you have the pipettes, waste bin, media bottle, tip boxes.
So thinking about what we discussed in the workspace, obviously a cabinet is a bit more compact, but we still want a good workflow so that we keep a clean and sterile environment without knocking things over. So looking at these diagrams, which cabinet do you consider the best for a right-handed worker? So the right answer is A. Because you've got your um, pipettes and tips um, and media bottles in the right positions for you to work safely. So we've looked at the four services of error, pipettes and tips. Um, so best pipette, optimal pit tips, different pipetting techniques, pre-wetting tips, angle of aspiration, how to pipette difficult liquids so that we get the most accurate results. And finally, we looked at the environment that we work in so that we stay safe and allow us to pipette correctly. So as we said, pipettes are precision measuring instruments that require extensive training and hands-on experience to produce repeatable and accurate experimental results. The graph on the left shows how much variance there is amongst even experienced laboratory professionals when it comes to pipetting. And then post-training, the graph on the right the professionals have, after training, the professionals have significantly reduced the variance in the group which advocates for continuous training for professionals on best pipetting practices. We all know that right after training, all those new skills are fresh in our minds, but only with continuous training do the skills really settle in. So I now want to introduce to you the Peakers 2. Um, this is our newest electronic pipette. It has been designed to ensure reliable, repeatable pipetting results. As we discussed earlier, we get reliable and repeatable results with an electronic pipette because the pipetted volumes are independent of the pipetting experience of the user. There are other features as well that help to ensure accurate and reproducible results. So the Peakers 2 is now Bluetooth enabled. And with help of the Sartorius Pipetting mobile app, you can be guided through sample preparation protocols, as well as service and calibration reminders, which means that you can ensure that your pipette can be serviced and calibrated on time. And the ergonomic design helps to reduce strain and tiredness to the hand, which helps, again, as we've discussed, to ensure that correct pipetting techniques are used at all times. There are many pressing modes. We discussed the serial dilution um, and others earlier, but we also have a plate well tracker as well, um, which helps to reduce the risk of a manual error. So just a quick poll. First question. Are you aware of the Sartorius Pipetting Academy? And the second question, would you be interested in any of the following Pipette Academy topics? So everything that I've shared with you today has come from different Pipette Academy modules that were mentioned in the poll. If you'd like more detailed training, then I do recommend that you take part 
And there on the screen is the website address if you're interested. Thank you so much for attending this webinar and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Great, um, thank you for that interesting presentation, Kate. Now let's move straight on to the Q&A part of this session. The first question we've got here for you, Kate, um, is an attendee saying that um, when they are pipetting some liquids, sometimes they notice that one, due to um, capil capillarity, a little bit of liquid flows inside the 10 microliter tips before they start pipetting and that may impact accuracy and precision. How can we solve this problem? And two, sometimes right after they remove the pipette from the liquid, the liquid moves up and it seems like they're missing a few microliters. Um, could you provide any insight on why this happens? Okay, so on both of those um, issues, the, the capillarity, 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 I can't say the word today, um, and the fact that the liquid moves up, both of those are taken into account with the um, by the pipette and tip manufacturers. We're well aware, obviously, capillarity happens. We're aware of this. So, in earth, in 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 terms of accuracy and precision, I wouldn't necessarily be concerned about that because, as I said, it's taken into account when in the design um, and. Um, of the of the product um if you're still a little bit unsure then obviously pre-wetting tips so that's when you take liquid up and then dispense afterwards always helps to ensure that you're getting accurate results um and obviously again if, especially if you're using difficult liquids you can always use reverse pipetting Great, thanks a lot for that, Kate. Um, and the next question I've got here for you is um, an attendee saying, for forward pipetting, um, we push to one to aspirate, but when we dispense, should we be pushing to one or two? Um, so just to go through this again, you first of all, to, you, um, first of all push to one to aspirate, just to step one to aspirate. And then obviously you lift it up back to zero. And then for the dispense, you push to one and then to get rid of the final bit down to two. So you push down to one for aspirate. Great, thanks for that. Um, and how is the techniques for use um, with viscous liquid? How Do, how, do you have any um, techniques um, you can do um, to um, yeah. affect viscous liquids probably. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> viscous liquids are really, really difficult. So if you are using an air displacement pipette, then my suggestion is that you do it very slowly. Um, so release when you're when you're aspirating, do it when you're lifting that plunger up do it really slowly as slowly as you possibly can and that helps to prevent those air bubbles bubbles coming up um so that that is my my best suggestion for um viscous liquids if you've got a really really viscous liquid say for example like something as thick as honey then actually you may be better using a positive displacement pipette Great, thank you for that one. Um, and which type of pipette is more accurate? Uh, so this is this is a a good question. I mean, it, again, it depends on what it is that you are um, pipetting. So there are two principles of how pipettes work. We have air displacement and positive displacement. Um, most of us in the labs are using air displacement um, pipettes basically because they're widely available and actually the costs of the consumables are lower. Um, and as I've mentioned earlier, we can use positive displacement pets for those really problematic liquids, such as really viscous um, liquids. Um, but you can use air displacement pets with, with the correct techniques. Um, 
Electronic pipettes, obviously, as I spoke about in the presentation, it can eliminate a lot of the variation um, in pipetting and the variation between users. So an electronic pipette um, with the piston movement is controlled automatically, regardless of the user. So that is probably can be your most accurate. But I, I think it very much depends on what it is that you're doing. Great. Um, thanks a lot for that. Um, and how do I know that my pipette is accurately dispensing? So regular calibration and performance checking is the only way to make sure that your pipette is accurately dispensing. Um, and obviously, if you're doing performance checks, then you need to make sure that you're using an analytical balance um, with a moisture trap. Great, thanks a lot. Um, and how can I improve my accuracy when working with dilution series? So, um, as we said, pipettes are precision instrument tools and obviously require training to use them accurately and precisely. Uh, you need to make sure that you follow your best pipetting practices and consider the liquid properties um, to improve your, um, to increase your accuracy and precision. Um, Obviously, with electronic pipettes, these remove those dependent variables and can be used to further improve the repeatability. Um, for dilution series specifically, um, you should ensure that all solutions are properly mixed. And um, if you want any further training, then please talk to your Sotoys representative and um, they can help you with perhaps a pipette academy. Great, thanks a lot for that, Kate. Um, and does connectivity or Bluetooth affect the battery life of the PICUS 2? Um, the PICUS 2 battery, um, so the PICUS 2 battery is exactly the same, lasts for exactly the same amount of time as the PICUS and PICUS Next, so you're not going to experience any differences even with the um, connectivity part. Great, thanks a lot. Um, and what is the difference between the PICUS 2 and PICUS and the PICUS NXT? Okay, so um, we've added a few things in. So obviously um, the connectivity features, so PICUS 2 can be used over a Bluetooth um, connection. We have improved the colour display, so it's, it's new and it's even better. Um, protocols have been moved to a Sartori's pipetting app, so there is no longer a menu entry um, called protocols and pipette, but you do need to use um, the mobile app. Um, we've replaced the accredited calibration certificate with a QC certificate. Um, compared to the PICUS, the PICUS 2 has the features from PICUS Next. Um, so things like password protection, service reminders, and pipette locking are all included. And you can update the pipette firmware with uh, mobile app. Great, thanks a lot for that one. And I have another question here from an attendee, and that is using the, uh, the same pipette for a long period of time can affect the pipetting as it increases the temperature. How long um, can you keep using the same pipette in one session? That's a really good question. Um, so yes, you're absolutely right. As you use, as you're holding a um, pipette, it can warm the air column, so that starts to have an effect. Um, so, how long? I, I, don't, I can't give you an actual time, but my recommendation is that when you're not using the pipette, put it in a pipette stand. Don't wander around with your pipette in your pipette pocket, in your lab coat pocket, we've all done that. But of course, you've got your body heat um, that can also affect it. So, um, yeah, I can't give an exact answer on that, um, but it is something to bear in mind when you are using a pipette that when you stop using it, then put it in the pet stand um, so that and not in your lab coat pocket. Great, thank you for a lot for that insight. Um, and I've got another question here about ISO um, 8655 um, standards. Do, does this um, require the temperature of water to be checked before performance checking pipettes internally between calibrations? I'm going to have to come back to you on that one. Um, 
because there is there is something about temperature, but I I cannot answer that question without checking. Um, I don't want to give I don't want to give the wrong answer on that. So, um, yeah, can I can I come back to you on that question with the more yes, that's question? completely fine. Um, you can follow up with the attendee by email after the webinar. Um, so mm -hmm. I'll move on to the the next question. Um, do you recommend um, mixing small amounts of liquid using a pipette? Um, if you're going to pipette it, if if that if that's what you're required to do in terms of, um, I mean, if you've got small amounts of liquid, yeah, I mean, if if you've got if you're adding two liquids together and they're a small amount, then yes, I would. You know, I would use before I pipetted it out. I would, um, I would mix it and also, yeah, um, and obviously do it carefully. Um, if it's a kind of a foaming liquid, um, I think it just depends on what it. Yeah, I, I'm not sure that I completely understand that question, but yeah, if you're about to, if you if you put two liquids together, I would mix them first. Yeah, I, I think that um, yeah, that's what they, they meant by that. Thanks. That was an interesting answer. Um, so I've got one more question for you before we have to wrap up. Um, and that is about pre-wetting. So the pipette goes into the sample, aspirate, dispense again, and then aspirate to transport a volume. Does this not cause a yield loss? So asking for the use of pipetting suspended um, metal oxides, and that's at microgram amounts. Yeah, so first of all, I don't know about metal oxides, so um, I so I can't answer about that particular bit. Um, in terms of um, what I mean by pre-wetting, so you aspirate, dispense, aspirate, dispense, so do it two or three times so that you pre-wet the tip. Um, so, yeah, that's... Um, that's how I'd yeah that's my answer to that one great thanks a lot for that one and I'm afraid I'm going to have to wrap it up there um, but thanks again to Kate for today's informative discussion and presentation thanks again to everyone joining us online as well and thanks for your interesting questions I hope that you've all found this a worthwhile session and if you have any other questions please feel free to email me at editor at selectscience.net and I will follow up with your questions for Kate and remember, you can also download a certificate of attendance in the related resources tab to the left of your screen. And if you would like to listen again to today's webinar or invite a friend to listen, it will be available to watch on demand in just a few days time. Goodbye and thank you once again for joining us.